Let's get started. The International Park and Mobility Institute is pleased to present this shop talk titled Turning Parking Data into Valuable Insights. My name is Kenny and I'll be assisting the moderator for today's shop talk. If you need assistance at any time uh, during the program, please raise your hand or use the chat feature and we will assist you. Today's shop talk will last 60 minutes. Please feel free to queue up a question for us at any time in the chat for today's presentation. You can also turn your microphone on and camera to ask a question or make a comment. This shop talk will be available on YouTube in a few days. Romy, do you mind clicking a few? Uh, we have upcoming shop talks as well in September and November, University Shop Talk and Airport Shop Talk. Um, and we also have all our previous shop talks for this year available on YouTube. Romy, do you, thank you. Also, Cap Track. If you are interested in becoming a Cap, uh, sign up for the Cap Track and you'll get all information uh, re related to Cap going on and what can pertain to your uh, Cap application. And member benefits, if you are interested and are not already an IPMI member, you are uh, free to, uh, this is a, a member benefit and all the um, uh, free uh, benefits you get for being an IPMI member. So if you're interested in that, please contact us and let us know. Thank you, Kenny. I think, I think that's, uh, that's it. Yours. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for, for having having me and welcome everyone. I am not sure what part of the country you're joining us from today, but I do see some familiar faces and names and I know that it has been a very, very hot summer. I, I can tell you that uh, very recently I took a trip to Tempe, Arizona and uh, just to try the 117 degree weather and it was, I never felt anything like it. And I do live here in South Florida. It has been hot, has been uh, super humid, of course, if you're familiar with South Florida, we get the afternoon thunderstorms and then, you know, there is just a, the heat turns on and the humidity uh, about 150. So if you're worried about your hair, this is not the place to be in summer. So I'm hoping everyone is enjoying your summer. You're having some uh, family time, maybe some downtime. I am planning to do so um, on Friday. So this is going to be my um my last, I think, official duty here for, for this uh, spring and summer. It's been a busy conference spring season, so looking forward to some downtime as well. As a result, I'm putting in my, uh, my summer reading. This was a gift on Father's Day by my daughter. Um, for some reason, she thought, you know, that instead of uh, a nice pair of shoes or golf shoes or, or, or a club, that she would just, uh, you know, indulge me with uh, something that she thought I should read. So this is on my summer reading list uh, as I head to on vacation on Friday. I will be reading this because she's asked me every every week, hey, did you read the book? Did you read the book? I'm like, honey, it's likely that the stuff I'm going to see there, I'm going to read there. I've, I've probably been talking about it or I've been hearing about it. So just uh, we'll see how it goes. With that in mind, of course, you know, start with, you know, the you know, paid paradise. There's also a song about that too. Uh, which I kind of have. But this is one of my favorite quotes here that I've um, on, on April 2nd, as I was getting ready to go into a uh, session, uh, one of the regional conferences, my, my uh, notice from, uh, from the Wall Street kind of hits and you know, the title basically says America has too, too much parking. And of course, uh, any one of us on, on this, on this, uh, on this uh, virtual round table today, we definitely will click on that link. And I did. And I read the article, et cetera, but you know, it was the same thing we've heard over and over. But this, this quote was, was interesting. Uh, America has too much parking. And then it goes on to say that uh, economists, however, say expectations for inexpensive or free on-street parking creates the appearance of scarcity when in fact spots are plentiful nearby. This reminds me of my time where I would literally have arguments and fights with churches around town because the church will have this massive parking lot completely empty every day of the week, except on Sunday, 9 a.m. And we would say, can we just use this during the off hours? And of course, the priest, the reverend, the pastor would say, no, of course not. You know, we have to have this available in case our parishioners need it. And I was like, the parishioners only come on Sunday. But anyways, no share parking, therefore the scarcity perception. Um, my favorite other kind of mention here is that drivers prefer to circle the block looking for government provided curbside parking rather than paying. And this takes me back to my time in, in public and you know in public administration where you know we clearly understand and many of you who are on the call understand that there is a clear subsidy of parking as it relates to what we do every day 
And all that just leads to congestion. And it's why, why we're here today. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the data that's been collected, some of the interesting facts. Um, and for me is it kind of puts me in a position where over the last uh, 11 months, I've been on a, on a new row and really focused on what's happening on the public right away or on the curb. And it brings me back to where I started in parking 34 years ago, where I was a parking enforcement officer writing parking tickets. Um, and you know, basically understanding what was happening from a visual perspective, anecdotal perspective, you know, that, you know, the supervisor would send you out to a particular street and say, hey, go out there because you know what's happening. And you get there, and it's typically the you know, same loading zones, you know, the same, you know, uh, blocking the corner, the same fire hydrants because, you know, commercial drivers wanted to find a spot to deliver and or employees wanted to find a spot to park for free. So it's it's just understanding now putting all these things in perspective and then putting some i guess some uh, uh some some pretty numbers around really what some of us may have already estimated so starting out with some some figures facts and figures which which um uh, which is always useful e-commerce growth since 2020 you see the the number which is pretty significant food delivery year over year growth and you know, and you think about that, well, is it really, I, I just had my lunch delivered here before the, before this call. Um, you know, my, my boss, Jordan, doesn't let me go out for lunch, so I have to order in just in case. Uh, delivery vehicles in major cities and what's expected. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, the reduction of passenger vehicles. But on the e-commerce, I think you may have heard me say this, because um, uh, I've, I've said this now, I'm going to have to get a new, a new, um, a new, uh, a new joke or a new uh, story here. My dad's going to have to help out. But my, I, I think my, it was uh, right after the pandemic, my dad, um, I tell my dad that some packages have been delivered on my house. And uh, I was with, with uh, Liz in, in Naples, Florida. And I said, can you go by and, and make sure that you put those packages in? My dad calls me back and I don't take his call. I, I'm, I'm on another call, calls me back again. And now I start getting worried because my dad never calls and, unless something's happening. And when I answer the call, I'm like, I got to take this call. My dad says, look, you know, the UPS guy made a huge mistake, man. He's dumped a ton of boxes in front of your house. There's like, there's like 12, 13 boxes. And I said, well, what'd you do? I said, well, I put them all inside, but I don't know that. I don't know that that's all yours. Like, there's no, no way. Well, Fast forward to a couple of days, we get home, every box had my wife's name on it. So she has contributed heavily on that number of 43% uh, for sure. There's no question that she has been a contributor. Catherine Haver, I see you there. I know you've been contributing to this uh, year over year commerce uh, growth because I know you're buying shopping a lot online. So yeah, this, this happened and it has happened. And as a result, these are the figures that we're seeing and the impact we're seeing. So when it comes to commercial activity, and, and in the curb, you know, we're, we're seeing an estimated about 50% or greater than 50% of the activity is resulting from that commercial uh, commercial activity. 37% of the double parking that, that we're experiencing is happening as a result of, of that activity. You know, over $9 billion of failed deliveries and parking tickets. And this has always been the, you know, the one thing that uh, over the last several months, even in my previous life in mobile payments, well, these, a lot of these companies do uh, they, they do budget for these, um, you know, for, to, to get these parking tickets and to uh, receive these, these fines. But the reality of the matter is that we're trying to solve a problem that is about reducing congestion and reducing emissions and safety hazards, et cetera. That's just not, not a solution. So allowing for someone to budget so they can go ahead and, and break the law and, and create more chaos, it's just not, not a reasonable expectation. And then, you know, uh, commercial drivers, less than 5% of them paying for parking. And then the emissions piece, that is, it's very significant as well, if there is, if that is a, a driver. So we, you know, uh, about the uh, beginning of the year, our team, you know, uh, embarked on a, on, a, on a survey and uh, interesting and eye-opening survey, but, you know, it just kind of proves or at least confirms what some of us um, expect. And, and this survey in, you know, with the help of the RightShare guy who um, uh, is a leading resource for gig workers and delivery driver, you know, we collected 152 responses um, and, and I'll, I'll share some of the results of, of, that, of that survey. But 
again, you know, uh, surveying companies like FedEx, Amazon, you, you know, USP, Lyft, Grubhub, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we, we, we just try to identify what, you know, what, what's the growing problem with delivery, uh, delivery drivers. I'm not going to speak on, on, on the numbers uh, as it relates to the graphs. I'll, I'll, I'm going to focus on the data insights. Um, you know, the team that's led by a Neo Merchant um, did a phenomenal job of, of basically highlighting and identifying some of the data insights. And really what keeps me, uh, you know, when I look at these numbers, it's like, okay, there's, there's a confirmation. But uh, knowing that drivers increasingly waste more time searching for, for parking and then the comparison, seven and a half. Uh, percent last year, less than 2% of the drivers finding parking when they first arrive at the curb, with 25% of them continuing to circle to find the spot. Now, I'm not a gig driver or gig worker, or, and, I, and I definitely don't work um, uh, doing it as a commercial vehicle, but uh, even when I travel for my own benefit, I'm one of those individuals that, you know, my kids, my wife hates it, that I, I will go around the block a couple of times because I know that the spot that's in front of that store where I'm going is gonna become available. And I, I am contributed to that congestion and that chaos. So finding parking upon the first arrival of the curb, you know, becomes pretty, pretty difficult. So what about time spent searching for parking? Uh, on the average drivers are parked somewhere between three to 10 minutes and more than 75% of the drivers spent more than four minutes searching for a place to park. That is, that was up 40% from the previous years. Now, four, four minutes doesn't seem like a lot of time, but it is pretty significant when you are a commercial driver trying to deliver a package or a service. You know, the missed deliveries cost um, commercial uh, companies significant amount of money, billions of dollars, as it relates to the fact that that package, if at the end of the day it's not delivered, has to come back to, uh, to their hub and get, gets unloaded and then the next morning gets uploaded back into into the truck that is significantly more expensive and costly than getting a parking ticket average park duration when conducting business this is also a, a very interesting in comparison 2021 and 2022 and again now we got a couple of years of comparison uh, looking forward to what year three brings uh, as, as we turn the corner here in 2023 but um, you can see again that um, drivers make a strong case, case for a pay by, by the minute approach, giving on their duration of stay. And, and this is, you know, um, a good confirmation of, you know, how much or how long does it take to conduct their business. Most common action drivers take when they can't find parking, uh, very interesting. Parking in a spot that is not meant uh, for me. Uh, you can see that number pretty consistent year over year. Again, congestion is not uh, it's not getting any easier. You know, continuing to to driving around the, the block until you find a spot. So between those two, you know, that, that's pretty significant. And then you add double parking. It's um, that that's tall tale. And you know, and then you see why it's up fifteen percent from the from the year before with double parking up about 10%. Um, and double parking being a major cause of a lot of the congestion we see in our cities. A bit of, um, uh, you know, uh, of numbers on, on number of tickets while on the job. Parking tickets are on the rise. We know that in some cases. And asked how often they receive the ticket, more than 25% of the drivers said one to three times per month. So up 20%. Again, we talk about, okay, yeah, some of these uh, companies um, and major corporations do budget for, for this increase. However, if you think about the mom and pop companies that are, you know, the plumbers, the electricians, et cetera, um, even some of the gig workers, a parking citation is basically can wipe, can wipe out their entire uh, profitability of the day. Uh, it, it's just a reality. So they, they do not budget, they do not have a budget for, for parking citations and they prefer not to get a parking citation, they'll prefer to park, and in many cases, pay and park. So average time spent paying for parking. Um, you, you can see that, um, you know, this, this is, is quite, a bit of, quite a bit of data around, you know, from the data insights, but 
for many, that's 50% of the total time they spent parked, now completely dedicated to the payment process. And in many cases, that payment process for those who the other 50%, they abandon that payment process because they just focus on, you know, trying to get their, their job done. So um, also another interesting data point. Most common reason drivers are unable to find parking on the curb. Um, in some cases could be payment, but nearly 20% of the drivers share that the most common reason they cannot find parking on the curb is because spots are maybe too expensive. And, you know, you can see, you know, the, the different questions that we ask in this category, how they stack up with all curb parking spaces near the destination is occupied. Again, there's still a, a, complexity, a complexity around, you know, where we, where we want to park. And in some cases, because there's delivery in, involved and there's packages involved, et cetera, parking near a destination is, is important. So availability is important. Um, loading zones designated for, for me is blocked by another vehicle. You know, uh, I was up a pretty, pretty, pretty good number there. So the, you can see the, you know, the correlation be, between those two. Parking experience improved by automated payment solution on a scale of one to five, you know, uh, over 65% of the drivers that were surveyed expressed that their parking experience will be improved by an automated payment solution. And that also had an increase uh, of 50% over the, the previous year. So let's talk about the solution. And I know my good friend and colleague is on the call here, Dave Honorado. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically use the city of Pittsburgh and a collaboration with DOMI, their mobility and infrastructure department, as to you know what was the solution as it relates to um, some of the data that we have seen, some of the data we've collected. Well, uh, the adoption of a comprehensive curb activity data to inform smarter policies and regulations, but more importantly, uh, uh, trying to increase the compliance in policies and a fully automated uh, uh, payment and enforcement program. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, at graduated rates to incentivize turnover. And we have been talking in this industry for many, many, many years about the um, you know, graduated rates and dynamic rates, et cetera. So this is, a, this is an adoption of a progressive dynamic rate. And what the data shows is that it has had uh, the impact that it was hoped to have in, in the city of Pittsburgh. So, uh, PPA, Domi, you know, uh, embarked on some uh, anticipated outcomes. And, and this is, you know, before a program starts as it relates to adopting, you know, emerging technologies and specifically, you know, truly focusing on managing, you know, the curb, aligning on policies, parking and loading policies with real time data, um, decreasing in emissions as well, because you're reducing unnecessary idling, reducing traffic caused by, um, by the uh, congestion of double parking. And there were a couple of numbers that, that were attached to a couple of, 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 of key, um, key numbers. Uh, of course, you know, there's a generation of, of revenue, uh, a parking authority, a parking department. You know, there's always, you know, we know that at the end of the day, uh, constituency services is top of, top of mind or from elected official perspective, however, we understand that you know revenue generation and budgetary uh, requirements are also uh, a, a significant component of what we do, uh, or what these city departments, city uh, agencies are doing on a daily basis. And then the improvement of safety for pedestrians, et cetera, increased delivery efficiency. On, on the on the improvement of safety, you know, and safety, you know, in, in improving safety hazards. You, know, you just think about you know the, what what's created uh, when you know when a vehicle is double parked or when vehicles are parked in a you know uh, blocking a, a bike lane or or bus zone or even a pedestrian uh, crosswalk. Um, so a bit of the overview, uh, and, and and you see here a map of how Domi, uh, uh, PPA, Dave, and, and the team kind of approach approach this this project is that most of the smart loading zones were located in, in a downtown neighborhood, again, where most of the demand, most of the activity was occurring. And we're just from anecdotal and some of the, some of the data that have been collected by either you know, parking meters and or citations that have been issued, uh, you can identify those zones. Um, 
all, all of uh, or most of the zones were all unpaid uh, before the program began. Uh, there was a, there has been and, and continues to be a, a pretty lengthy, you know, process uh, and discussion around, um, you know, what does it take to pull off a program of this magnitude? And it's really around the cross departmental co coordination. And I highlight the two logos for, for that particular reason. Um, it's very difficult for any one entity to be able to, you know, uh, adopt and, 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 and basically roll out a program where you know there is a change of you know the economy is a change of, of of paradigm from what we've been used to what we've been seeing and introducing uh, an emerging technology to manage uh, what has in the past not been uh, at all uh, managed. So cross departmental co coordination, the ident identification of zones, um, incredible stakeholder engagement, and of course uh, funding and the funding happening by either a combination of grants and or revenue generation. Which is typically how uh, it's it's it, how how it works. And at the end of the slide, I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon you know the opportunities for for that funding that occurs through you know through um, uh, through a different mechanism. So some some of the results uh, that we've that we've uh, been able to um, capture over the last um, you know from the from the beginning of last year or, or so till the end of 2023. That the total parking events after implementing, you know, what I just shared, the total parking events have, have increased. Um, and, and you can see that trajectory. Um, and, and it, you know, and, and then the question, I, I share some of this data, we've had discussion around some of the data is, uh, you know, how does that happen? And, and we see that it happens because um, there's a decrease in, in dwell time. You know, and, and there's always a correlation for me is, as I remember writing parking tickets and then overseeing a, a parking enforcement department, I, I remember there was a correlation between meter revenue and parking citations. And every time the, a zone or multiple zones were, you know, there was a decrease in parking revenue and our CFO would come in as well. We had a decrease in this month in zone, you know, 413 because, you know, the revenues versus the previous month or the same month of the previous year, are significantly down. I would st strictly go to the to the citation data, and there was a direct correlation that, you know, no enforcement, no revenue. So again, uh, we see that if you create a, you know you create turnover and parking availability is you know you reduce you know dwell times. Obviously, you have the availability of more parking, increasing uh, the park events. So um, parking events increase regularly since the kickoff. Dual times have dropped during the program. Um, we can see an increase in turnover and optimization of the loading zones. Uh, these zones are overwhelmingly used by passenger uh, vehicles, but uh, over time, other modalities have increased the use of the zones. So the dual time consideration is across all modes. Double park average amounts per location. This is a, another interesting data point. Uh, and double parks uh, dual time on the average, you can see a decrease uh, as well. And um, again, important on the correlation that, you know, there is automation and there is, you know, there is signage um, and there is the expectation that, um, you know, there will be enforcement. Uh, we're also tracking propulsion type and combustion engines dominate the total number of vehicles. And, and that's, I, I think we, 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 we had anticipated that will be the case. However, there's an increase in electric and hybrid type vehicles that are, are you know, are utilizing the zones um, and, and the space. So uh, with the, you know, with the, uh, the, the higher adoptions of these, of these uh, propulsion type vehicles, we are likely going to see this data become much more significant um, over the next 12, 24 months. So a bit on the, on the results. There was an, you know, the aim and, and then the progress through 2022, aligning policies with real-time data. Um, 2022 results incoming, informing change in smart loading zones, hours, days, operations to encourage demand to move to off-peak. Uh, I, can, I can tell you and I can assure you and, you know, and, and you can check in with Dave and his team. Uh, it has not been, you know, it's, it's not been an easy process, but it has been a process that has, that has required a tremendous amount of commitment by the PPA, the team, you know, and 
and Domi and and then uh, other city administration. That's just that's just a reality. It's been intentional to have a program uh, be successful. A decrease in emissions. Um, so emissions calculations is, is an ongoing effort in 2023. Reducing parking costs by traffic. Uh, traffic reductions to be assessed in 2023 since we have a year of of of, of data to that has been collected. Reduce double parking by 60%. Uh, 25% of double parking and dual, ta- dual time reduction is what we're seeing right now. Uh, expected to continue to increase. A generation, and, and that is as a result of, you know, when the uh, fine management, fine citations uh, begin to uh, be issued. Uh, generated, uh, generate additional revenues uh, from parking uh, and loading zone. Revenue generation obviously was picking up as the program is being more widely adopted. And that will continue to uh, to be the case. A program that started with 20 zones and uh, currently at about 60 and moving to about 200. Uh, increased turnover, obviously benefiting local businesses. We've seen a 50% increase in parks utilizations, and u- the utilization will continue to track in 2023. Uh, improved safety for pedestrians, cyclists, and other curb users. Uh, again, a, a 2023 metric that we're tracking. And the efficiency, increasing the efficiency and reduced all time. And, you know, we've seen some of the numbers from, from the survey, but uh, anecdotal feedback from large fleets support that adding loading zones, uh, you know, due to operational uh, zones, due to operational improvements uh, do work. So um, this, this is a, you know, an aim and process through, you know, the first uh, nine, 10 months of, 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 of adopting a, you know, this, this, this new, new process to manage uh, commercial loading zones or smart zones. What we're seeing is, you know, that leveraging uh, insights and data, uh, automating payments and automating, you know, the curb enforcement does have an impact and the results of what happens in in the public right away. We have seen that in many cases, you know, the start of a program by having, you know, collecting that data and then, you know, basically uh, taking that data to adopt policies or uh, update policies is important and critical. I've, I've shared throughout the beginning of the year that, you know, the one with the one item that is really eye opening for me is that in my 34 years of parking, if I will start working at the parking authority today in Miami and I will be trained as a parking enforcement officer, the policies and uh, legislation that I'll be working today are the same policies and legislation that I worked with 34 years ago. And that is, that is incredible when I was thinking about that, that my training and development as a PEO in 2023 will be the same training and development from a policy perspective that was in 1989. And that, is, that has to change. There is no way that we can, uh, as an industry, uh, be in a, you know, uh, be welcoming the curiosity of technology, the adoption of new, new, new emerging technologies and expect those technologies to exist and to uh, survive with policies that are totally outdated and do not support you know, the innovation of today's, um, today's world. So it, it, is, it is a process of that mobility and insights that quickly moves to automation of payments or automation of invoicing, just the creativity that we see today in tolls. Um, you know, and, and I use this, I remember going to, from Miami to Orlando, there were four or five tolls that you had to literally stop and with, with the paper, you know, throw coins at this, you know, uh, booth attendant and do the same on the way back. And, and then, you know, you could, then they, they accepted dollars, they accepted cash, but it started with coins, just like we did in the meters. And now this, this you know, tolls are managed strictly by, you know, by license plate the movement, you know, it's a hundred percent compliance. Everyone that is using a toll and, and, and pay tolls is it's 100% compliant. Everybody pays, um, and and this is this is where we're finding ourselves. And of course, the automation of the enforcement, which we know um, uh, does does happen, does exist. Uh, think about the fact that you know when I when we implemented an LPR uh, camera, I don't know maybe in the early 90s or mid 90s, uh, slips my mind when, but that we had at, we will ask the officer to basically double park get off the vehicle and place the ticket in the windshield. And in 2023, we're asking the officer to double park, uh, get off the car and place the window 
the ticket and the windshield. Uh, that again is mind boggling that we continue to, um, you know, uh, operate in, 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 in policies and, and legislation from 1989. Um, so it, it's, it's a good day uh, or it's a good year for, for, for the public right away for the curb. It's a good day for all of us who work in this space. It's a good day for, you know, our executive directors like Dave and, you know, and Alex and, you know, and, and, the folks who are day-to-day -day managing, you know, these you know, sizable operations. And the good day is that there's, you know, that there's a recognition where, you know, uh, federal dollars are being um, allocated to assist in, in the management of, of, this, of this public right-of-way. Of the $94 million and 59 projects across the country, $18 million were identified for very specific current management related uh, projects. And that is, just uh, from my perspective, it is a good day because it is the dollars who are going to help us change the policies and update the legislation that we need in order to adopt these, you know, these um, uh, curb management related um, policies. So, you know, quote from uh, our friend Jeffrey Tumlin from SFMTA, um, we can't manage what we can measure. And that is, you know, and obviously that is better done with, with the digital tools that are available to us. And that to, to me, and to us in the rest of the industry has to be uh, has to be a good day when we know that there is the availability of not only some resources from a financial perspective, but also the technology allows you to uh, adopt practices that can generate that revenue that can pay itself and can pay for for these programs. That is uh, about 35 minutes of, uh, of the presentation. There is no way that I can keep you guys here for an hour of me talking that's just not possible so i will open it up for q a and hopefully i can see oh there's a chat here sorry all right but you are you also able to speak if you're able to speak you could also chime in uh unmute yourself i think if you can yeah feel free to unmute uh, or ask questions in the chat Romy, it's Dave. I just want to thank you for the shout out, but uh, kind of agree with you. The information we're collected through uh, the curbside uh, technology has just been invaluable. And, you know, <clears throat> now that we're going to rule out the automated enforcement, I think it's just going to increase the compliance and be that more valuable to us on the uh, curbside. So it's been a, yeah. a great 12 months, if maybe not a little bit longer, but it took us a while to get there. but. It was well worth it, the efforts. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I agree. And the, the more data we see, you know, every month that goes by, every week that goes by, we're looking at this data and, and just in awe as to the impact of, you know, when you automate something, when you track something, um, you know, we see the, the, the results. I, I actually, uh, Ken Smith, I was talking to Ken Smith, um, yesterday and uh ken smith you know literally we are talking about something uh, different and he says hey man romeo i have some good news for you i said yeah or what, what what is that he said um our month over month revenue uh doubled in in meter revenue i'm like well that's great how, how, what happened well they adopted uh a you know progressive rate uh structure and their on street for their on street parking so he's he says i know we all been talking about this but this proves that it does work and and there's been a reduction in citation which is also which also works so um you know more data as it relates to you know to the opportunity to support the fact that you know these progressive rates uh, do impact uh you know, behavior and we're seeing it in the data we're collecting dave and pittsburgh and other places as well Catherine? Yeah, hi. Great presentation. Really spot on all the all of the curve stuff related to turnover, reducing idling, safety. In Connecticut alone, we had the highest pedestrian deaths and in, in, in injuries last year because of all of the vehicles and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the reduction of citations is a big thing. But the conversation you you had related to legislation. Municipal and government policies. 
I mean, you explode and move, and those and also operating processes. I mean, you talked about 1989, and we've all experienced that in municipal government. Things change at a glacial pace, and changing behavior and it's like changing culture and how people think about parking. Um, that's really where you're going to see things catapult. Um, so, you know, we just have to keep talking about it, but. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, and it's going to take the, you know, uh, the results of what's happening at, with Dave and at PPA, Ken and Omaha, you know, Columbus and uh, Boston and Miami. And, you know, even with Miami Dade, uh, it's going to take, you know, Santa Monica. It's going to take all the results of that data and the support of that data for, you know, the rest of us to basically say, you know, this is why, this is why it works. So when Ken gives me the good news, he knows it's because he's fighting a good fight that he is collecting data that's going to support, you know, the continued, the continued effort to change policies and, and to be able to, you know, to support the growth of the economic development and the growth of, of his downtown. There's, there's no question. And then as it relates to, you know, zero emissions, um, the zero vision um, uh, program, right? It's, it's reducing safety hazards. We have a responsibility because we control that space and we manage that space. Um, right. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I like to say it's a, it's a, you know, it's a mano a mano combat and it takes a tremendous amount of commitment by, you know, leaders like, you know, the guys like Dave and, and Ken and, and, and Alex to say, we have to change this policy. We have to change ordinances or otherwise we're not going to be able to, uh, to expand and we won't be able to meet the objectives of, you know, safety hazards and, you know, and uh, related accidents and death, et cetera. It's just, that just doesn't happen. You got to have to, you got to have the carrot and you're going to have to have a stick. Yeah. Can I add, Romy, too? Uh, yeah. With the data, we were in, it does take time to, for change, policy change at a higher level, state level and that. But five years ago, we were trying to do it by ourselves. Now, with the data and the safety concerns, the city's on board with us, the other municipalities here and the other regional uh, associations in Pennsylvania, we're speaking as one voice now up at the state, and it carries much more weight uh, as going up as a uh, te united team instead of trying to do it all by yourself. They, our voice is uh, heard more when we're you know, all together fighting for the same cause, and having the data to back that up, I think, makes a big difference. Yeah, 100%. I, I think I remember the last time I went up to uh, city council uh, to ask for a rate increase um, in, in one of the southern cities, major southern cities. The city council said, well, what, what data do you have to support this? And of course, all I said, it was like, well, it's my gut. I've been doing this for, I don't know, at the time, 30 years. I mean, you can't, you can't, that doesn't work. I mean, it just doesn't work anymore. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I was trying to maybe add a little bit more gray hair. You know, well, I've been doing this a long time, so you should trust me that we should increase you know, the rates from 50 cents to a dollar. How about that? You know, it, but you know, now it's just, it's available. We just lean, we can lean on it super hard. Um, it's no longer anecdotal. It's no longer based on your gut or experience. Any other comments, questions? I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, COVID taught us that, you know, uh, this is a pretty good medium to have a, a pretty good conversation about the stuff that, you know, that really matters in our day to day lives. So uh, I've I've enjoyed uh, obviously sharing my thoughts, um, the data and, um, you know, meeting with with this group. I know it's summer. I know there is a lot happening. But uh, it's just great. Thank you, uh, IPMI, of course, for the for the opportunity and for the great number of sessions that, you know, for the um, for the opportunity for our members to um, to really participate and benefit from the very comfort of your own office chair or home or wherever it is that you are. So thank you, Sean. I truly appreciate it. It's uh, great work you guys continue to do. And uh, and we need you to continue to do that great work because. That's how we're gonna. Uh, that's how we're gonna make things happen. Thank you, Romy. Appreciate all your help.
Any other questions? Oh, T, T Marks, you have a question? <clears throat> hey, Romy, Toby here, yes. City of Bend. I have a quick question hey, for you. Toby. Because, so we all know, right? Like loading zones, curb management, large cities, that's an easy one or relatively easy one because they already have loading zones. So what's your suggestion of like a roadmap or framework for like a small city or mid-sized city like we are, Bend, where the only three loading zones we have in town are the ones that we did as a favor during COVID to somebody over the last two years. And we don't have any other loading zones, but we know it's a problem. So what's your suggestion on how do you actually navigate that field, especially in a close-knit business community in a downtown core that to communicate, look, the trouble that you're experiencing can be solved, but you also need to potentially give part of the compromises because like in our case, we have angled parking everywhere, like going to loading zones there, it's like, yeah, that's a big sell, right? To businesses because I will turn 50 parking spaces into loading zones. Just would be curious about hearing your thoughts on that. If that makes yeah, sense, what that, you're asking. No, no, it makes a, a tremendous amount of sense because, again, at the end of the day, I think that the shift that we have to, uh, you know, to 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 make is is that the, the paradigm has to be around. We've always used to seeing loading zones or commercial loading zones. From my when I got trained, is a vehicle has to, you know, be a commercial vehicle that has to have letters that are three inches by six inches, and you know, has to be at a fixed sign and blah 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 blah. So. You basically have to look like you know commercial vehicle. Well, that has changed, and and the, the you know the gig economy alone has changed the way goods and services are delivered. The other day, we delivered uh, from our office in LA to I don't know to one of our uh, one of our members, one of our team members. So I, I think we delivered a package, uh, literally in, in an in an Uber. Like, hey, we need you to take this from this location to that location. Well, that Uber, that Uber or task rabbit, whatever it was, gig economy uh, driver, you know, parked in a loading zone in front of our office to deliver that. So the, the, the thought process is that the data that we're seeing from a commercial delivery uh, perspective, it goes beyond these big trucks of FedEx and, you know, and Amazon. It, goes, it affects those who are in our communities making a living nowadays by delivering in their own individual, you know, single use car, right? And that's what's happening. So. It, it, and it's why I refer to, you know, we refer to them as smart zones. You know, we've seen hospitality zones at Omaha. You know, Ken was super creative by saying, you know, hotels have this, this drop-off, pick up a drop-off area. So they've named them as hospitality zones. So for, in, in their case, a, a smaller city that basically has a need to be able to pick up and drop off, but they, they don't want to lose the revenue or potential or opportunity. So they, they figure out a way to, you know, to compromise that. So basically identify what, you know, and I know you're starting to collect some data, but basically identify what is the data collection is telling you to say, hey, we have a bigger problem. And the problem that's being that's caused by this congestion or this double parking or that's caused by this, you know, um, you know, a lack of dwell, you know, or increased dwell times because we're just not accommodating the real needs that happen in this community around the, you know, the, the need to deliver goods and services. And I think it's it's why I, I think the journey for me, the curb management journey starts with a data collection, data analytics, and then it moves to that automation. Uh, and, and and that's how that's how uh, PPA, you know, uh, and Dave were able to do that. You know, Ken in Omaha is doing that. You know, even uh, Bethlehem, you know, Steve, which is a very, very, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, very small town, uh, it's gonna do the same, same, same concept. Basically saying, hey, we're small, we're mom and pops here, but mom and pops need to park. And as a result of that growth and that demand, we're seeing ourselves, you know, with double parking, increased congestion because of this, not having the availability, so. Yeah, it makes sense, thanks. Any other questions? You could raise your hand or type them in the chat. Oh, I'm hearing nothing. Romy, any final words? 
No, it was, again, thank you for the time. Thank you for the opportunity. Great seeing some, some of you here, seeing, seeing your name. So uh, hopefully this was, this was beneficial. I, of course, enjoy talking about anything that's parking related, as you guys know. Um, you know, I, I will volunteer anytime just to have a chat. And, and I, you know, I remain open to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, as Ken called it, you know, call me to give me some good news that's related to what we're trying to accomplish here, all of us together. So great, great seeing everyone. Have a great uh, day and great, great summer for what, you know, for what's left. I know some of you, uh, winter is coming, so enjoy it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Romy. Great job. Thank you, Romy. Nice seeing everyone. Take care. Thank you. Yeah.